Okay, um, I, as, as you know, uh, my name's John Stewart. I, um, I was the chair of the coalition of organisations which uh, successfully stopped uh, the third runway at Heathrow. I always, I always say that at the beginning because shamelessly, shamelessly I go for applause. <laughs> Uh, what, what I'm going to talk about just now is the overall challenges that we faced and the strategy that we adopted uh, to defeat the third runway. But I think first of all, it's worth saying that the third runway at Heathrow was the runway which the airport, which the aviation industry in the UK wanted above all else. Most of you will know that Heathrow is the main airport in the UK. It's, it's the one truly international airport in the UK. And for 10, 20 years, the aviation industry wanted a third runway. That was their big prize. And, that was, and that's why there was such a battle. And when we won, that's why the aviation industry did not believe, and they still do not believe, that the prize they wanted above all else has been snatched away from them, essentially by a coalition of community groups, local residents, and environmental activists. I'll say more at the end of how the aviation industry has reacted, but I think it's worth stressing that this was what they wanted, and therefore, this was the battle that we had to fight and that we had to win. And it's the first time in the UK that a new runway at an airport has ever been defeated. So it was a major shock for the aviation industry not to get the biggest prize of all. Let me tell you a little bit now about the strategy and also about some of the tactics we used. Occasionally, I may be repeating some of the things we said in the workshop over there, but just pretend you're still interested, all right? <laughs> okay. The first thing we did, we, we heard rumours of a new runway in the year 2000. But there were also plans for new runways at other airports in the UK. Now this was important because it enabled us to try and make aviation a national issue. I know a number of you have been saying to me during the, uh, when we've been having our coffee and our uh, sandwiches, how do we make the Munich issue a national <coughs> issue? How do we make it more than just a Munich or Bavarian issue? I think you have an opportunity because I think what's happening in Germany with protests in Frankfurt, in Berlin, elsewhere, for the first time I think there is a real chance to make aviation, airport growth, a national issue in Germany. And once that's done, then the press are interested then the press at a national level begin to debate not just about uh, expansion at individual airports, but begin to debate the whole question of the role of aviation in Germany. I think you've got the opportunity to do that now, and that's one reason why I think we're here at a very exciting time uh, in, uh, in your history. The first thing we did, the first thing we did was we formed a body called Airport Watch. This was a national network of all the campaign groups fighting the different, fighting expansion at the different airports across the UK. It brought, it brought together the campaign groups alongside 
some of the national environmental organizations like Friends of the Earth and Greenpeace who also began to fight aviation. One important thing that it did was this. It made sure that no campaign group was saying, we don't want expansion in our territory, put it somewhere else. Now that used to happen. Before I was involved, 20 years ago, <coughs> the residents at Heathrow would say, we don't want expansion here. So many people live under the flight path. Look at the airport in Stansted where there's lots of green fields. That's where it should go. <laughs> As Stansted would say, we've got wonderful countryside. It mustn't be destroyed, put it to Heathrow. Now, once you, once you do that, once you have this nimby factor, not in my backyard, then actually I think we've lost. So, one of the important reasons for bringing together Airport Watch as a network was to get over this factor of putting <laughs> in the expansion somewhere else. Airport Watch was not an organisation, it was a very loose network of campaign groups. And there was only one <coughs> rule to be a member of Airport Watch, and that was no expansion at my airport or anybody else's. Once you're saying that, you also have the chance to challenge government policy. If you're simply saying, and I know you're not in, in Munich, but if any airport is simply saying, don't expand at my airport, there is no opportunity to make the wider arguments, the climate change arguments, the economic arguments against airport expansion. So the formation of Airport Watch was the critical first step, was the frame within which we campaigned at Heathrow. Coming specifically to Heathrow itself, we, these were the four key uh, points of our strategy. And I think they arose from lessons we had learned in the past. Local residents at Heathrow had fought previous expansions. Terminal 4, Terminal 5, and lost every time. This time we decided to try and see what lessons we could learn so that we didn't lose again and we won. The first one is that we formed a coalition. How, in the past, at Heathrow, residents had very good arguments against airport expansion. But they're on their own, with the support of maybe one or two sympathetic politicians. They were never going to be powerful enough to win against the power of the aviation industry and the government. My view is, however good our arguments are, unless we challenge their power with <coughs> our power, then I feel we're probably not going to win. So we formed this coalition. I'll say more about the coalition in a minute. Secondly, we challenged for the first time the economic arguments. <clears throat> Very often the authorities expect local residents and environmental groups to complain about the noise and the air pollution and the climate change emissions. And we do that. But so often, we ignore the economics. And every single uh, <clears throat> major expansion, major bit of infrastructure, be it a new airport, a new runway, a new motorway, is usually justified on economic arguments. And my view is, unless we are engaging with those economic arguments, 
we're fighting the battle with one arm behind our back. Again, I'll say more about it in a minute. Thirdly, we put forward alternative solutions. So we weren't just saying no, we said there's another way of doing things. And again, I'll come back to it in a minute. And fourthly, we ran a high-profile campaign, a proactive campaign. We didn't just wait and respond to the local authorities timetable, we tried to set the timetable ourselves. <clears throat> That's the summary, and I'll, come, I'll deal with each point in turn. The coalition was made up of residence groups. Now that I can work this, I'm going to give you it every time. <laughs> made up of residence groups who were particularly interested in noise. At Heathrow, 150,000 people would have lived under the new flight path with a plane coming over one every 90 seconds. It's totally understandable that noise were a big concern. Local authorities, very important, local government. Sympathetic politicians, we tried to gain them from all parties. But we were very clear that the politicians were not to lead the campaign. However decent and supportive a politician is, there's always the danger that he or she will put his or her political party first and the campaign second. So yes, welcome the politicians in from all parties, but welcome them on our terms. We must set the agenda. If they support it, they join us and can be very helpful. <clears throat> Fourthly, in the Heathrow Coalition, national environmental organisations came on board. Particularly in our case, Greenpeace. Now, Green Greenpeace had not really campaigned on aviation issues in the UK before. Why I think they got involved at Heathrow was because Heathrow was such an important uh, uh, test of the government's climate change policy. And they felt that if, we, if, if Heathrow could be defeated, then the climate change debate could be moved on. So the national environmental organisations largely came in concerned about climate change and they brought, as I will say later, they brought uh, expertise and Greenpeace, I've got to say, always brings money. So listen, if, it's quite a good idea if you get Greenpeace on board. Uh, no, 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 welcome, wel welcome them for their, for their principles, but take their money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, um, the, but also, with organisations like Greenpeace, with large environmental organisations, there is the same danger as with the politicians. They can sometimes want to take over. So they must come into the coalition on the coalition's terms. And, and to be absolutely fair to Greenpeace in the UK, they were superb at that. They came in and formed part of the coalition and brought their strength, <coughs> brought their expertise, but didn't want to take over. If the large organisations take over, then sometimes the campaign is run to their agenda rather than to yours. And lastly, this is where Dan and Tamsin come in, the environmental activists. Uh, over the last 10 years, Climate change has been, become the big environmental issue in the UK. Climate change, when we were fighting the third runway campaign in 2003, 2004, etc., etc., was right at the top of the environmental agenda. And what it brought in was a whole new uh, uh, group of young activists who were desperately concerned 
on what climate change was going to do to the world. And I'll say later, the young activists, as you saw today, if you were in Dan and Tamsin's workshop, brought ideas, energy, creativity, naughtiness. Okay, so it was a very diverse coalition. Local residents, she had lived under the flight path for many years, <laughs> sitting down at the same table with direct action activists who uh, blocked the entrance to EasyJet headquarters. Another local resident who lived, as you see, very close to Heathrow, Greenpeace, a conservative politician, a Labour politician from the left, and uh, people whose homes uh, would be knocked down. These two young boys are saying they're Robin, age 10, and Louis, age 6, and BAA, who own Heathrow Airport, stop trying to destroy our lives. Now, why I've shown this is these, are, if you went into an English pub, these people are very unlikely ever to be drinking together. They, outside, outside this campaign, they're not going to meet each other socially. So the challenge for building this coalition was how do you get these very different people from different backgrounds and with different outlooks working together. I think there are a number of key things. First of all, people meet each other face to face. And when people meet each other face to face and possibly go for a meal afterwards, then they get to know each other as individuals rather than just the representative of a political party or a, a radical organization. But the second thing that held the coalition together, there's two more things. One is that we didn't try to agree to any detail. It is very tempting, it is so tempting, when you're building a coalition to try and have pages and pages of a manifesto that you all must sign up to. My feeling is that is fatal. Because the more detail you put in, the more opportunity there is to disagree. So put as little detail in as possible. And in fact, all we agree to, simply this. The one thing and the only thing that held us together is that we were all opposed to the third runway to throw. And that's all we had to sign up to. Now actually, that wasn't too difficult. The more difficult challenge for us was that different people were going to use different tactics to oppose the third runway. Plain stupid, Dan, Tamsin, if you're in the workshop, we're going to use direct action. I think Monica here probably doesn't do direct action. But she'd be very good at writing letters. Politicians, local authorities, they really work within the corridors of power. So we had this slogan, which was the slogan which drove everything. If it needs translation, it, 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 this may need translation. Unity of purpose, because we're all against the, the third runway. Unity of purpose. Diversity of tactics. Also Zweckgemeinschaft und die Diversität von von Strategien oder Taktiken. Das ist ein bisschen holprig in Deutsch, aber im Englischen ist es gut. And and better in English. It's better in English. Doesn't translate. Why better? Why better? Can you speak English? Translate out of it. No. 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 No.
over a period, people began to accept, uh, politicians accepted that plain stupid would take direct action, and they wouldn't criticize them. And equally, plain stupid would understand that the politicians would operate in parliament, and they wouldn't criticize them for that. Unity of purpose, diversity of tactics, what, was, was, was our slogan. Can I ask a question? You um, certainly can. In Germany, I think a lot of times when you have the diversity of tactics labels, it means that some rather, rather radical left-wing groups might be using violence yeah. against things, probably not people, but definitely things like police cars and stuff. Was there a non-violent that, that, That's a great question. I should have said that. I think the only reason this worked is because the direct action was absolutely non-violent. There was no violence at all. Uh, Plain Stupid were a non-violent direct action organization. The climate camp, which came later, were absolutely committed to peaceful direct action. If there had been any element of violence, then there is no way that some of the right-wing or even left-wing politicians could have supported it. In fact, if there had been violence, there is no way that Monica or our friend here would have anything to do with it. It was very, very important that we're running right through it. The fact it was, it was, as I say later, it was, it was fun and it was creative and it was challenging, but it was not violent. Thanks for that. That, that was good. Okay. As I said earlier, the, the, the coalition gave us the benefits. <coughs> it gave us more power to challenge the power the tremendous power of the aviation industry and the government. <coughs> and this one's interesting. I said just now that it was a diverse coalition and it took a long time to get people working together. But once we got the people working together, our diversity became our strength. Because no longer were we just fighting the government on one issue. We could fight them on noise, <coughs> destruction of homes, climate change, air pollution, economics. In the past, when local residents were fighting on their own against Terminal 5, it was noise. The government only had one battle. Here we were able to give them a whole range of battles. And I think what emerged from the workshops that uh, Helga and myself did was the same thing is emerging here in Munich. There's a whole range of different issues and diverse issues. And that's one reason why I really do think you have a, a tremendous chance of winning this campaign. You're working here together and you're working on a diverse range of issues. You're challenging on this, that and the next thing. Okay, the second lesson we learned was we challenged on the economics. Now, what we didn't do, and Christina was saying a similar thing about uh, Munich, we didn't challenge the fact that Heathrow has helped the UK economy, because clearly Heathrow has benefited the UK economy. But what we did challenge was the reason, the economic reason they were given for a third runway that a third runway was essential for the continuing health of the London economy. <coughs> That's what we challenge. And we, we commissioned an independent report. And we made sure that we didn't go to a green consultancy. Because if it was a green consultant, however good he or she might have been, the government and the aviation industry would say, well, they would say that anyway. It would not have credibility. We went to a Dutch consultancy called CE Delft, who have done work for the aviation industry, for campaign groups, and a lot of work for the European Union. They had credibility. And they produced this report for us, which actually backed up our case. I won't I won't go into the details right now, you know, it's a Saturday evening, the last thing you want, a Saturday evening, is when we can talk about the details of the economics. So, I won't go into the details, 
But the report is here and it backed up our case. And we sold this, we launched this not under the flight path. We launched this in the heart of the city of London. We invited financial journalists and economic journalists to come and was reported in the Financial Times. This, this did surprise the aviation industry. How do we pay for this? Because it costs a lot of money, 45,000 plus euros. That was the benefit of the coalition. Some of the big organizations like Greenpeace helped. We also raised some money from uh, what we call charitable trusts. Uh, uh, <coughs> but it, was one of the, the, it was one of the key things that we did. It, it, it demolished their case on economics, but it also helped our case with the Conservative Party. I'll just take a moment. The third one way was being proposed by the last government, which was a Labour government. I don't think it was a socialist government, but it was Tony Blair's and then Gordon Brown's Labour government. They, they were in favour. The Conservative government, which is the right-wing party, the traditional party of business, hadn't made up their minds. When David Cameron, who is now Prime Minister, became leader, he wanted to show he was a new type of Conservative leader. So he, he, he embraced the idea of climate change. <coughs> now, if you are going to build a third runway, if, you, if, you, if you're going to believe in climate change, a third runway doesn't fit. The figure we had, if a third runway had been built, Heathrow would have been the biggest single source of climate CO2 emissions, climate change emissions in the UK. So Cameron was moving away from support for a third runway. He also, as a clever politician, began to understand he would win votes in London by opposing it. But this was the traditional part of business. This is a, 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 a Prime Minister now who takes a right-wing economic perspective. What this report did was reassure the traditional party of business that, the, that London's economy would not suffer if they came out against a third runway. And we were talking in the, in the, in the, in the workshop there, and I, I think there are opportunities maybe uh, to, to, to make a similar economic case here. In fact, I think the economic case may be easier to make because, as Christina was saying in a very entertaining presentation earlier on, the, 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 it is, the, the, the reasons given for the expansion of Munich are just ridiculous. You know, four to, to, to stop four minutes of late instead of nine or something like that, that is just ridiculous. I think the argu your arguments are easier to win because they're more ridiculous than the Heathrow arguments. I, I must have gone forever. No. Um, we, we also promoted alternatives. Uh, ideally, we were saying Heathrow should be a long, a long, an airport for long distance travel. 30% of the flights are short distance, domestic flights, or to near Europe. So, what we did, we actually had a race. We had from, from uh, the House of Parliament in, in London to the Eiffel Tower in Paris. And somebody went by aeroplane, and somebody went, Sarah, went by train. Now, I would sort of looked at the timetables beforehand. They had, they had to start in central London and end up in central Paris, so you had to get out to Heathrow. And I thought, actually, if everything's okay, the train should just about win. Well, I, I don't know, some of you will believe in God and some of you will not believe in God, but that afternoon I definitely believed in God. Because, would you believe, there was an hour delay from the plane taking off at Heathrow, and it sat for another hour on the runway at Charles de Gaulle. By the time of Sarah, had got to the, the Champs Elysees, the Eiffel Tower. She was on her way home in the Eurostar, drinking her wine, <laughs> while the person from the plane was struggling up the Champs Elysees, 
three hours late. <laughs> I, don't know that, I don't know if that's evidence for God or not, but it certainly was that afternoon. <laughs> but what it did, what it did, it dramatically highlighted. Look, we were talking, we've been talking all day. How we've got the arguments. You have got the arguments big time. You've got the figures. You can be confident about them. Absolutely confident. You, you, you don't need to be ashamed of arguing with the authorities because the arguments are on your side. The, the critical question is, how do we put those arguments across? So the press understand them, public understand them, so that they are dramatized. And this is one way we try to dramatize the idea that actually it can be just as quick and more convenient to travel by, uh, by train uh, than by short haul flights. Um, okay, let's, let's move quickly on, otherwise I'll go on that. Right. And th right, this is the key thing. This is our fourth uh, uh, part of the strategy. We ran a proactive campaign. We were talking earlier, I think it's somewhere in Germany. In the UK, when they, the authorities have a big new runway, power station, motorway, anything. And people get worried, they say, don't worry. Don't, oh, don't worry. You can wait for the public consultation. Now, you don't need to understand English too well. That sounds great. Public. You, the public, will be consulted. We'll listen to your views. And of course, it's very understandable. Local people who haven't been involved in politics before think, I will wait. I'll sit back and wait. <laughs> and, 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 and then the public consultation comes. They make their views. They, and the authorities may or may not listen, but they say, don't worry. You have another chance. You have a public inquiry. <laughs> public inquiry, you come and speak. The fact that the public inquiries are held during the day, when most ordinary people are at work, doesn't matter. But, and this is what people fall for. And in the UK, over the last 40 years, only one road building scheme, I was involved in opposing road building schemes in the 80s and the 90s before I got involved with, with Heathrow. Only one national road building scheme has ever been stopped at a public inquiry. If we were to win public consultations and public inquiries too often, they would soon abolish them and try something else. Now, it's not, it's not, it's, I'm not quite saying ignore them, but I am saying, whatever we do, don't put our faith in those dreadful words. Instead, we must run a proactive campaign scoring uh, uh, with our own events. Now, actually, before I come to that, what, there was a public consultation. What we did, a public consultation is a marketing exercise for the airport. Uh, they held 16 big events in smart hotels to promote them. What we did is we held our alternative consultation in the same smart hotels on the same day, and they were furious. But, but that in itself was worth doing, just to annoy them. But the other benefit was, we were saying to the public, to the press, to politicians, we as a coalition are confident enough in our own arguments to stand up there and, and have our own com and, and, and defend our arguments publicly, just as they claim to be. It was a sign of the confidence within the coalition. And I actually believe that you, as I said before, you've got the arguments here to have that sort of confidence. And I think part of the, part of the question, part of the way of doing things, is to show that publicly. Now, I will go on forever. So, we did the obvious things. By, we didn't wait for their, for, for their public consultation. We didn't respond to their public inquiry. Organize, these are the obvious things. We organized our own big meetings, some big demonstrations. Uh, well, Townsend climbed onto the roof of the House of Commons. That's the British Parliament. Now, this, of course, is this is the most proactive thing you can do. But we we typically 
timed this for the last day of the public consultation. So the timing was critical. You know, we, this, is, this is the most dramatic way of, of subverting their consultation, of not playing by the rules. It also demonstrates how the coalition worked, because that meeting, 3,000 people, respectable meeting in central London, where alongside politicians, plain stupid, uh, representatives of plain stupid, the direct action organisation spoke. Two days later, plain stupid were on the roof of the House of Commons. And so the plain stupid actions, however dramatic they were, were part of a wider strategy. And I think this is very important when we come to talk about non-violent direct action. If direct action <coughs> activists are simply doing it on their own, it's very easy for the authorities to marginalize them. But when they're linked to a wider coalition, and particularly to local people, to Monica, who we saw earlier on writing her letters, to the woman under the flight path, <coughs> then that frightens the local authorities. They don't quite understand what these links are. There we go. Now, now this, is, this, this, this was Leo, who was on the roof of the House of Commons for a plain stupid. But this is where, and this is what, um, this is actually, let me tell you who these people are. <laughs> That's Leo from the, uh, the plain stupid. That was the Minister for Transport at the time, who was about to give a speech <coughs> to the aviation industry. This was a local resident who had invaded the uh, stage, and instead he gave a speech to the aviation industry. <coughs> but that looks dramatic, but I think the important thing here is that this was local people, ordinary people, who had never taken direct action before, taking it with the help of people like Leo for the first time. Now, it, because I'm so ancient, so what, I started taking direct action many years ago in the anti-Rose protests. But I've got to say, the first time somebody said to me, John, will you take direct action? Will you climb a tree and you know, stick yourself in the tree? I thought, I can't do that. Taking direct action for the first time is frightening. And I don't think we should be, uh, we should, we should, um, be worried about admitting that to ourselves and to others. And for something like John here, who had never taken direct action before, local resident in West London, this was quite a frightening experience. And I, I suspect as many people in the audience here, many of you are thinking, actually, maybe, I should, maybe we should do this in our campaign, but can I do it? Could I actually do what Leo did? Can I do what John did? Uh, my view is you probably can. The critical thing is we all do at any particular time just what we're comfortable doing. Don't try and do something that you think that's not me. And, if, and the other critical thing with direct action is to do it as a group, and perhaps as a group uh, uh, which will include some direct action activists. But, my initial experience many years ago was, was actually quite terrifying. And that's a natural reaction. But, but I actually believe that the direct action was a critical, it wasn't the only thing in the campaign, that it was a critical part of the campaign. And it could, if non-violent direct action in some form or another could become a critical part of this campaign, I believe that gives you uh, a greater chance uh, of uh, victory. And listen, if you get really worried about it, I know Dan and Tamsin are happy to come to Munich any time to hold anybody's hand <laughs> as they're about to take direct action. Dan's already put um, his hands free. Okay. Now, this is also direct action, but, this, but if people don't feel like you can climb up the roof of the House of Commons, House of Parliament, and I must admit, I couldn't see myself climbing the roof of the House of Commons. <laughs> This is a flashbulb. Now we 
This is another way of getting our message across. The opening day of uh, Terminal 5. BAA, the owners of the airport, wanted a big day. We thought, now, we mustn't be nasty about it, but how can we steal their publicity and make our point about the third runway? So as some of you already heard, at 11 o'clock on the dot, we went into Terminal 5 with our coats on, and when the clock struck 11, we took our coats off, and revealed, 600 people revealed their T-shirts. I've got to say, that's the other terrifying moment. At five seconds to 11, you think, am I going to be the only one? <laughs> As if you are, there is no escape. <laughs> but thank God, 600 other people did it. And, and, and what you can see here, and this is why I say there's various levels of direct action. This is not the group of the House of Commons. This, this is illegal in the UK. It's what we would call an edgy action. Where you're not meant to demonstrate inside an airport. But look at the range of people. Children, <clears throat> older people, young people, uh, a wheelchair user, all there together. And the flash mobs became incredi incredibly effective because they were inclusive. They brought a whole range of people to do something that was just a little bit illegal. And they were fun. And it didn't last too long. It wasn't a boring march. I mean, some marches can be great, I'm sure. The ones you all that would be wonderful. But some marches, you must admit, can go on forever. Now, 20 minutes, it's done. And you go away for a cup of coffee. <laughs> and, and, and what I, I told the other people, I, I think we've got time for this, yes. <laughs> they became very popular. In fact, some, 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 particularly some of the older women used, used to meet on the train, get to know each other, and then they'd ring me up and say, John, can you do a flash mob? Outside the Department for Transport, I said, that's a great idea. Yes, I said, but it's very near a really good shop that we want to go to. So we can do the flash mob and then go shopping. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so it became a bit popular. So the lot, we did a European flash mob. We did, because you had to have a slightly different theme every time. I, I think it was London, Paris, Brussels, uh, several other airports the same day. Now, those of you in the workshop, just keep quiet for a minute. We thought we need a European, day, a big European day. So, the same thing happens in every country. Now, people who work in the workshop, what day do you think we chose? Just think for a minute. Think, think, think Shogun's. Think Tacky. Oh, they're not, they're not nearly so good. They're not Tacky, are they? You know, and the workshop was wonderful. Uh, Come on, come on. So, what, a European event. Football? No, cl close. It's even worse. Even worse. Valentine's what, what? Valentine's Day. Even worse than Valentine's Day. Even worse. Some content. What? Yeah. Some content. So, Europe, there's a man. There's a man off my own heart. The Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> How dreadful can you get? And what we, what we, what we all did. In the morning of the original song contest, we all went into our airports, did our flash mob, and we all had to sing our country's entry, entry to the Eurovision song contest that day. <laughs> oh, the Euro the Britain one was dreadful. <laughs> no one. Uh, but, but what it did, you know, it was, it, was so, it was so ridiculously over the top that actually it got huge amount of press right across Europe because it tied in with an, a popular event. We were trying to make our argument, we were trying to popularize our arguments. And I never thought I'd say this, but thank God, the Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> okay, but alongside all that, you know, remember this was also a serious coalition. Leo Murray playing stupid, myself, a member of the House of Lords, a very traditional conservative uh, uh, politician, uh, a liberal democrat and a former policeman. So in a sense we were also, as well as our flash mobs and our fun, we were also trying to bring together this very diverse coalition. Now this is another example of it. As I said earlier, about 700 homes that have been knocked down with third runway had gone ahead. With several, 
with the thousands of people losing their homes. Very similar, we were talking earlier to your communities here. It was communities where people had lived for many, many years. Some people, some people lived there 80, 90 years. Those are great, great human interest stories. You know, the older the person, the frailer the person. In front of a camera, nothing can beat that. <laughs> but, 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 what, but, but possibly can beat that is those, those old ladies and old gents linking up with plain stupid activists. And what we see here are a mix of the local residents. And the young people are all plain stupid activists on their best behaviour. <laughs> and the idea was that each person whose home was threatened would be linked up with an activist who certainly in theory would help defend that person's home. So we went to the local church where a lot of these people went and it was very English, very English scenes, tea in cakes. And over tea, pretty dreadful tea, you know, cheap cakes, um, three peas weren't paying. Uh, we, 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 mit, we, we mit the activists to the residents and we picked them out of a hat. You know, one activist, so you know, and our town will, town will tell you. Some of our wonderful, and they were wonderful, some of our wonderful little ladies, I have never seen them so smartly dressed. I said, Audrey, you're really smartly dressed. 80 plus. Yes, I'm looking for a, really, I'm looking for a handsome young man. <laughs> Now, I, did, I, came, I was taking about, I did cheat, I, I did cheat with Audrey, I found her. Actually the youngest and best looking young man. She was an irrelevant, she didn't, she didn't wait for the photo. <laughs> but, but, but again, this is an example of activists and uh, page working together, and that sort of picture is what would really frighten the authorities, because they do not expect these sort of things. We're almost there, that's victory. <laughs> That's Downing Street where the Prime Minister lives. Two days after the, uh, the new government came to power, now remember this is a fiscal conservative government, they, two days after their first big decision was to drop a third runway to the throne. And, and they also at the same time dropped uh, expansion at Gatwick and at Stansted. And in many ways, in Airport Watch, we felt this was the ultimate justification of working together. We hadn't fought each other. We had worked together, we say, and we won together. So, very, very quickly, just to repeat, the successful strategy was we formed the Heathrow Coalition, diverse coalition, we challenged the economic arguments. If anybody is very Finds it very hard to go to sleep tonight, you know. You can look at this. <laughs> the front cover's the best bit. <laughs> we put forward alternative solutions and we ran a visible campaign. And this is finally. We did more than stop the third runway at Heathrow. And this is what I think is real potential for yourselves in Germany. When you win such a huge and unexpected victory, you actually begin to change aviation policy. The new government is saying it will not build any new runways in the UK. It's still going to go for growth. You know, it's not the Green Party in power. It's still going to go for growth. But it is saying that the growth will be much less than ever before in UK history. And growth will always take account of climate change and residence quality of life. The issues we were fighting on. Now, the, the debate we have with them now is how much growth. The debate with them now is how serious are they about climate change targets? Are they, are they, are they, are they tough targets or weak targets? How much noise are they asking local residents to experience? But that is a very, very different debate from the one we were having in the year 2000. Where, where, where we can make it a national issue we can change policy. And in the last couple of minutes, because I don't think there's another slide here. Oh, yes, yes. 
<laughs> now, do you, rec do you recognize, do you remember her? Remember who she was? The conservative, the conservative, uh, the conservative MP who was a politician who was supporting us. She is now in government as the minister in charge for transport was responsibility <laughs> for the new aviation policy. Now, partly that's luck. <laughs> <laughs> now, we can't play. That's partly luck. But it does show the kind of revolution that we think has happened. Two more, just two more minutes. Are we all right for time? For yeah, yeah, it's yeah. all right. It's all right, yeah. all right. Um, I, I want to end by trying to uh, translate some of this to relate some of this to where you are. So I feel incredible. <coughs> when, when Florian uh, 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 and um, other people ask me and Tamsin and Dan to come to Munich, we knew a bit about it, and I thought, yes, there's a chance. The more I've learned about what you're doing here, I am, I think I'm 100% convinced you can win. I said that to the press yesterday, you always say to the press, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't say to the press, look, I'm 95%. <laughs> the story will be, he doesn't think I'll win, so that, that's not right. Uh, but, but, but I do believe, I believe, I do believe we can, because, because the, everything's right. First of all, I think it's the beginnings here of a really diverse coalition. A whole mix of people coming together. Secondly, I think the arguments against the expansion of Munich Airport that we've heard today have thrilled me in some ways because the airport is so ridiculous. You know, this idea of building a new runway so, so the delays will be four percent or less is just, you know, the idea that came out of your your workshop. You know, you have four, four minute videos. Show them how ridiculous they are. I think you can really. I think economic arguments don't stand up, and maybe you can find a way of you know, funding something to do with that. The mix is right there, but, but finally, I think the other way that you can not only potentially stop the third runway at Munich, but help to change aviation policy right across Germany, is because there seems to be coming a time, and they don't happen very often, where there are protests of one sort or another, and they're different sorts, at different airports in, in Germany. In Frankfurt, as we know, 5,000 people are turning up in the terminal every, every Monday. Dan and I are going to, we, we can't really resist all the battle. So Dan and I are going to join them on, on Monday night. <laughs> uh, but we've got Frankfurt. There's been people on the streets about Berlin. There's been a protest in Dusseldorf and elsewhere. But I think the key, maybe yourselves, because I actually think, you know, Frankfurt has actually been built. Berlin has been built. It's great there are protests afterwards because that helps in everything. But here, you're starting early enough to win. I believe that Munich can become the Germany's Heathrow.